Hi, everybody. Welcome to a very special episode of SideQuest. I, of course, am Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon. I am one of the producers of Fun and Games podcast, as well as hosting too many podcasts on the Certain POV Podcast Network. I am also the producer and editor of this very show, and I have two incredible humans to join me to talk about a very special game. Hi there. I'm Jeff Moon, and I am the other half of everything else that goes on with Fun and Games podcast on the Certain POV Network. Uh, I'm a voice actor and a very avid video gamer as well. And hi there. I am Chrono Katie. Uh, I am basically, I make videos uh, on YouTube about different video games, and I post a lot of different fashion outfits, uh, sometimes based off of video games. And I'm also a wannabe writer. <laughs> I think that you are a writer. If you say you're a writer, there will be no wannabes here. That is fair. I, I believe in you. <laughs> I, I um, too work in a field where it's, I'm aspiring. Don't say that. You are. Yeah. You are. <laughs> that, that's fair. <laughs> um, Katie, I'm really excited to have you on the show. Um, we are talking about one of the greatest RPGs ever made, one of my all-time favorite games, Chrono Trigger. And I was connected with Chrono, Chrono Katie via the incredible... Scoop Jessica, who's a, f a friend of the show. Um, Jessica knows that I'm a diehard Chrono Trigger fan, and she went, mm -hmm. oh, you think you are? You need to check out Chrono Katie and her awesome content. And I she did. did like, she oh did not. She did, too. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, my God, there's someone who's a bigger Chrono Trigger fan than me. I didn't <laughs> oh think God. that was possible. Um, <laughs> so, of course, when we were planning on doing this episode, I, I had to have you on the show because um, it's just fun to see someone else celebrating a game that doesn't really seem to get a lot of love these days. You know, it was very popular at one point, but I feel like a lot of folks have forgotten about it, and it, it is one of my all-time favorites. And I think a good place for us all to start to talk about it is just kind of why this game is important and how we came to it. Now, of course, I came to it back in the Super Nintendo. Don't do the math. Don't try and figure out how old I am. It's fine. <laughs> the game was first released in 1995. Right, so do with that knowledge as you will. Um, <laughs> But uh, I was a big fan growing up, like a lot of boys my age, of Dragon Ball Z, because how could I not be? People beating the snot out of each other with giant beams of light. Uh, and so I was a big fan of Akira Toriyama, and a good friend of mine named Roy, when I was growing up, was like, oh, you like Akira Toriyama, you have to check out this RPG. He did all the art for it, and it's really incredible. I was like, what's an RPG? And then he like sighed. Um, and so he lent me his copy and I became obsessed with it. Um, I played it constantly. I got almost every en ending. And since then, it has continued to be one of my all-time favorite RPGs. Um, I don't know how close to 1995 I played it. I know I played it when the Super Nintendo was still Paramount. So I'm guessing, if not that year, then within a year or two of its release. Um, and yeah, and that that's kind of like where I came to it. Um, Jeff, what about you? How did you discover Chrono Trigger? I discovered Chrono Trigger kind of later, or sort of slowly, because I was an RPG fan from a young age. I played the original Final Fantasy on the NES, and my family's video game when games went from the NES straight to the PS1. So most of my ah. SNES gaming was at friends' houses. And because of that, I became more familiar with like the shorter or more level-based games, your Mega Man X's and Donkey Kong countries. But there was a copy of Chrono Trigger floating about my friend group, and it was floating. It would just, it was wherever I wasn't. It was ephemeral, <laughs> but it was, but it was in high demand, and everyone was talking about it. But whenever I did see it, there was no rhyme or reason to it at all. I didn't know where they were. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know who these people were. I just knew everyone loved it. And I tried playing it on emulators, but there's an early part of the game uh, around twenty the first time you're in 2300 AD where you have to hold down three buttons to get through an area, like with the computer. Oh, uh, ZSNES at the time can only uh, take two inputs at once, or maybe it was just the computers. So I got real familiar with the millennial fair, let me tell you, for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and I finally got to play the game in its entirety. You got to level 100 based off Gato alone. <laughs> exactly. I had so many silver points. You want to know the upper level of silver points? No, you don't. But I finally played it the whole way through after it came out on the Nintendo DS uh, after 2008. I, you know, played it when I would be doing theater jobs and manning the board. I'd open the open up my DS and play it a little more and play it a little more. And I absolutely loved it. It was one of those games that was so hyped up for me, and it still blew past all of my expectations. And now to this day, Chrono Trigger is kind of a 
I still don't have a good name for this phenomenon, but it's what I associate with the band Queen, which is a band okay. I absolutely love. I love, I love. There was never a point I didn't love them, but sometimes I forget and I hear other things and other stuff happens. And then here we are talking about Chrono Trigger and it's like, God damn it, it's good. No, no, but really. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Yeah, I love it. I was able to share it with my spouse who wasn't an RPG gamer growing up and it was her perfect game as well. So it's kind of become this quiet, fervent favorite for my household, definitely. That's amazing. What about you, Katie? Comparing Chrono Trigger to Queen, that's really good. I like that <laughs> Thank comparison, you. right? Yeah, actually. Um, you you both have me beat because I didn't play it until the DS version. Um, so I I grew up with um, uh, I started on the Super Nintendo. I watched like some of my family play or some of like my cousins and stuff play the uh, NES mm -hmm. and kind of looked on video games from afar. And then when we finally got a Super Nintendo, I was too young and our family wasn't like we didn't make enough money. So my brother like just kind of. He bought whatever, the few games he could, like Donkey Kong Country, Super Mario World, I think Super Punch-Out and stuff. So I didn't even know of its existence for a while. And the first RPG I ever played was Kingdom Hearts. Um, oh, and I fell in love yeah. with that. Sure. But I was, I was like Matt, a huge Dragon Ball fan. Like I remember the first time going over to my cousin's house and and seeing like I think it was Goku versus Nappa or something and just becoming completely enthralled in that and then I started watching the original Dragon Ball and I fell in love with that so Akira Toriyama's art style started like just permeating in my head basically and around like the when I was first starting to like use kind of the internet I was really getting into um IGN.com uh, mm -hmm. who like who I later even wrote for a little and mm -hmm. and I was like super I became super interested in like video game journalism like the idea of reviewing games and stuff like that and I remember one review stood out by Mark Bozon by this game called Chrono Trigger and of course immediately the first thing that stands out to me is a curatory on his art style so I'm like oh, I'm sure. gonna check this out mm -hmm. and then I see like all the like it's a classic, one of the absolute greatest games of all time. And I'm super into time travel because I loved Doctor Who and Back to the Future. Hell yeah. And I'm yeah. like, what? This is a game that is that is like Dragon Ball. That's apparently one of the greatest games of all time. And it has time travel. I have got to get this. So it was one of the very first only games ever that I bought based solely on a review. And I went and picked it up and I just completely fell in love with it and I didn't even like really come to appreciate it as much like I loved it the first time around but it mm. was really on replays which is I think we can all agree is kind of yeah. what Chrono Trigger is about um, oh, yeah. that I really started seeing like the genius of it and once I started to get into to writing and it, it inspired me to want to be a writer which is like my biggest dream so like I realized how perfect it is from a writing standpoint and everything and just that mix of everything going on, all of the things I love about it, while simultaneously also being honestly a pretty damn like perfect, almost perfect video game from just a mechanical and a writing standpoint. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's that's basically why I fell in love with it. <laughs> so you're batting a thousand on buying games based on reviews is what you're saying. Honestly, gosh, it was like, I think it was that and Jack and Daxter, and that was like the only two I've. And You're they ended a goddamn up goddamn mythical creature. Games, That's incredible. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I uh, it, it's funny. Chrono Trigger is one of those games that I always come back to, and for the longest time, until I decided that producing a podcast was a good idea, I used to play it every year. I would just mm -hmm. sit down with it and barrel through mm -hmm. to an ending at least once a year. It's been a few years since I've been able to do that, but it is on my 2021 list to go back to it. Um, this game has been on a bunch of platforms, um, but strangely, it's missing now in more modern platforms. So it was, of course, originally released on the Super Nintendo, then it was re-released on the PlayStation as part of Final Fantasy Chronicles, and it got a, a remaster along with some original new animated cutscenes from Akira Toriyama, and some additional stuff bridging it to its sequel, Chrono Cross. Um, which we don't talk about as much, although I have made myself promise I would revisit it, but that's a story for another Chrono time. Chrono Cross is a very interesting conversation that oh. is definitely worth its own, its yeah. own Agreed. podcast. Agreed. I think we'll yeah. have to follow yeah. this up in a little while with Chrono Cross. I've, I've got so great No matter what you think about, about Chrono Cross, it is at least interesting. It's at least interesting. <laughs>
That is definitely yeah. true. Uh, then, of course, as you mentioned, uh, Katie, it came out on the Nintendo DS. Um, it has since also been released on iOS and Android and is on Windows and Steam. Um, the Steam version, of course, is the famed mobile version, which is just not up to, I think, at least the same quality as the mm -hmm. original release. I don't, unfortunately, own any of the previous copies except the DS version. Um, I used to, for a long time, have the Super Nintendo version, and actually a friend of mine recently came across her old Super Nintendo version of it and is going to gift it to me, which is very exciting. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, I'm really excited. Dang, I, I actually amazing. have I have the SNES box for Chrono Trigger. I have the empty box. <laughs> the empty box, yeah. Um, see, see uh, you, say, you say I'm the bigger fan, but you played it before <laughs> me and you're going to get a Super Nintendo copy. <laughs> um, a shout out to MJ, uh, uh, aka Frankie, aka friend of the podcast. Um, she had found one, uh, I think it was her father's maybe, but she doesn't have any attachment to it or the game as a whole, uh, and so she's offered to give it to me, and so I'm very excited about that. But That's awesome. yeah. what, what's really fascinating about Chrono Trigger as a game is that it is, I feel at least, for that time, a much more complicated story than typically a lot of games had then. Now, admittedly, I didn't play Final Fantasy VI until much later, and those two came out around the same time, um, and does also have a complex plot, but what I love about Chrono Trigger is the mechanics it has and the different endings and the decision to do different endings based on when you end the game, where you fight Lavos, the decisions you make, is not something we see enough in games. And I think is a really key reason why this game has stuck with me. I mean, we're also gonna talk about the obvious stuff like the graphics were incredible, the sprite art, the spells, the incredible soundtrack that is one of the most iconic soundtracks in RPG history. And of course, you know, this has all stars of the Square director's team. It's just, what's what's strange to me about Chrono Trigger is it does seem to live in a bubble a bit, right? Like we mm -hmm. mentioned Chrono Cross before, but like Chrono Cross is the only proper sequel we got to it. There was Radical Dreamers, which was a text-based adventure that followed it up, but not a lot of people played it. It was only really in Japan. Well, it was also and really only released on the Satellaview, which was right. a very um, ephemeral format and it is it is essentially chrono cross 1.0 yes they were right. making it and they're like they're like oh we don't like this let's try again and then there you have chrono cross yeah and it's just fascinating to me that this series which is born out of final fantasy obviously it has similar sprite work it even has similar sound effects and and all of that stuff it didn't really get much love other than a few re-releases and it's just the void of it in modern consoles seems strange to me but i think i want to start by you know when diving in so first of all if you've not played Chrono Trigger, there will likely be some spoilers in this episode. I'm going to try and avoid some, but I am going to mention one right now. So if you want to jump ahead, well, I don't know, two or three minutes, you'll probably be safe. But one of the defining moments of this game for me was actually based on a mistake. So my friend, a friend of mine told me and was either incorrect or lied on purpose that you have to fight Magus twice before he can join your party. And I was like, okay, mm. Magus is the <laughs> coolest character. I love Magus because, of course, he's designed very similar to Piccolo, who is also one of my favorite Dragon Ball characters. And so, like, I was like, oh, Magus is a badass. He's, like, brooding and vampire-like. Of course, he's my favorite character. Yeah, right. Because I'm a teenager. Edgy boy, sad mage with but, a sight. So I was like, all right, I'm going to fight him, and then I'm going <laughs> to fight him again. And I'm going to get to bring him into my party. And oh, the battle ends. That's cool. And that I'm like, is... wait, where, where is he? And then I'm, I'm like, what? Oh. And I was like, ah, oh, shit, he's dead, isn't he? And so, but, but that moment stood out so much to me because that second fight is so incredibly badass and not easy. Like the first no. fight is not particularly yeah. simple, but that second fight is even harder. Like it just solidified why, and I was like, you can do this? Also, the idea of a villain joining your party was so foreign to me at the time because I hadn't played a lot of RPGs, and for sure none of the platformers or action games I played allowed you to do that. Like, this is well before the years of Super Mario RPG and Bowser being a sort of good guy all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, like, that was kind of really a defining moment with that game for me, and I thought I would give both of you a chance. Do you have any, like, what's your, like, strongest memory or moment from Chrono Trigger? I will also say that Magus's theme is hands down my favorite song in the entire soundtrack every, every time i watch somebody play the game for the first time i'm like no say no to the fight say no to the fight I'm like i'm not gonna tell you what to do but oh god i like clench up when they like have the 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 choice i'm like say no please on on the flip side one of my favorite things about sharing rpgs with my spouse is she 
she does become delightfully invested in character. She has favorites that I try to predict who her favorite characters will be, and I'm sometimes right. And mm. and I try not to spoil games. Like she went into Final Fantasy VII like almost 20 years after its release, completely blind, and it was such a joy to get to like enjoy that with her. But we're on Chrono Trigger, and she played it on the DS, so I didn't get to watch her play it the whole time. And I talked to her about that fight after she'd already had it. Oh she, no. No, no. I told her what she could do. It's like, but you could get him to join you. She's like, yeah, but he ruined Frog's life. Frog deserves <laughs> oh, this. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Frog was one of her favorites. And so it was just like, no, I, I'm with my boy Glenn here. Uh, this is what has to happen. I love that. Yeah. So cool. I kind of love that. Yeah. <laughs> that's the thing. I'm just like, and so I got to tell her after that. She's like, cool. No, that's great. I'm sure he's very cool. I told me that I told her all the stuff he does. She's like, that's really cool. You know, but she also doesn't replay games. So the whole new game plus is lost on her. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, that's a feature that's really impressive. Also, is this ability to jump right back into a game with everything that you had before. I, I don't know that any game had done that before. New Chrono Game Trigger. Plus is such a ubiquitous term now, and I did some research, and Chrono Trigger is, if not the first, it is credited with coining the term New Game Plus. And I, th I think people, probably some, some people don't realize that, like, while it is a really neat feature, it's probably, Chrono Trigger is one of the best implementations of it because it was created because of the way Chrono Trigger works, which mm -hmm. is that you can beat the game at yeah. any point and on your second playthrough, basically. And that's why New Game Plus was probably created. It was Absolutely. like, it was a tool, like a brilliant one to make it easier and easier to keep going and going and getting more and more endings. Right. Now, a lot of RPGs are built to be systems on top of systems, but the story and loops of Chrono Trigger very to be very cute for a moment they are like clockwork they are each unto themselves yeah. very complete gears that turn and work something i love about the story of chrono trigger is how fully it justifies taking your time to finish the game because you learn early on you've already failed but you also haven't failed yet <laughs> and your grand mission kind of shows itself fairly quickly very quickly in fact but Ever, all the quests you take on in the process allow you to get deeper and deeper into the world. They build in those endings throughout. Like, there's about 16 endings in the game that all come up at different times based on when you beat the final boss in the game. But in doing so, they had to make stories that were that had distinct breakpoints, endpoints. So you could bring everything to their completion, but you could also stop it here. And do you wonder about that? Well, maybe try to try it a, uh, differently the next time because you know what? Time travel, baby. So mm -hmm. it's, I think that's one of the things that speaks very well for the game is the fact that it, and also I played it on the DS to its completion first. So I already had years of PS1 RPGs of those 80 hour, 100 hour RPGs of side quests and grinding and super bosses and everything else and I love all of those I still love all of those but the fact that everything within Chrono Trigger has it it's fractal versions of rise and fall and heroes journeys within and things going on that you only glimpse and side quests that benefit only one party member specifically or the world in general and in doing either of those you become more connected to what you're fighting for. I I love that about the game. I, I love that you brought up like how you've already failed, but you haven't failed yet. That that's like such a that's such a perfect way to describe it because I think one of the reasons one of the reasons I love that you can fight I guess can can I go can I go into spoilers a little yeah. bit? <laughs> or, yeah. Love one of the reasons, we gave a fair yeah, warning. That, <laughs> to a 25 year old game one of the reasons i think that you can fight like one of the reasons i love that you can fight lavo so early on in the game is kind of it immediately like builds him up as this um just awesome force of nature yeah that of course like you can't possibly take on and to me that makes the game so like exciting as it goes on because like you are slowly, slowly getting to that point where you're actually going to be able to do it you're actually like you he's just almighty force that you kind of recognize throughout this whole game that like he can't be stopped like right. no nothing you do can stop him but 
as you're going further and further, you know the end goal, you know what you're up against, but you're slowly getting there and getting more and more powerful. It's one of the reasons I love the second half of the game so much is because the entire second half of the game is basically an op a more open um, like world where you mm. actually can go revisit all these areas that you've experienced already and all these characters you've experienced already in an effort to power up against Lavo. So it's kind of like it's kind of like the long version of like every Final Fantasy of the old days where yeah. like the characters are about to lose and then everyone in the world just magically prays for them and then they suddenly have the strength to beat the final boss. It kind of it's that but yeah. like way better because it's like this whole entire long section if that makes sense it does it does well it's it the two final fantasies that it's most like are the ones that were developed around the same time six and seven final fantasy six you are fighting a classic uh save the world plot then the villain wins halfway through and you can spend mm -hmm. as much or as little time as you want or can afterwards after the world ends to try to salvage it you have 2300 mm -hmm. ad and Final Fantasy VII, you have your final boss waiting in a giant crater at the top of the world. He's just, all of disc three is just, anytime you're ready, buddy, come on. Yeah, but having, yeah. the, having the final <laughs> boss be not a fixed location, but a fixed point in time, it, it, it justifies that he's always there. Literally take your time. You have a time machine. Mm -hmm. And it becomes an interesting thing where, yeah, as you do that, your your perspective shifts, and there are so many shifts that happen. You learn the final boss so early on. There's no fake out. There's no uh, suddenly no the god of death is your is what no yeah exactly it, it's, yep it's mm -hmm. Lavos the game beat Lavos game end. But what that means and who's behind it or why or mm -hmm. what that shifts. It, it's it's a great it's a great argument for sometimes. Spoilers don't spoil anything. I had one of the it's, biggest it's, yeah. things that happen in the game that we haven't even talked about yet. The event that necessitates the titular Chrono Trigger. I had that spoiled for me years before I played the game. You know what? That moment still got me. Mm -hmm. And knowing it could happen and knowing it could be prevented and knowing everything that goes on within that, it didn't weaken any of the punches. It didn't pull anything. It only made it more for me i think it's, yeah i kind of, i sometimes call chrono trigger the greatest detective story in any video game because really it's about like finding out where did lavos come from who created it what is like how do we stop it you know yeah oh, and that's exactly what happens yeah and some of the answers are pretty shocking actually yeah it's kind of a fun <laughs> meditation on the uh myopic nature of history you stand at a fixed point in time and you go, well, these things happen. Well, if you if you were able to go back a thousand years, was it though? Was the great hero <laughs> really the great hero? Did these things appear when we say they did? I mean, it's great to write all these things down. I'm not, I'm not saying history shouldn't happen. History is wonderful. The study of history is wonderful, but it is human. Or, you know, if things went a little differently, reptite. And <laughs> thus, <laughs> flawed. Yeah, I mean, what I love about the time travel in this game is that it's not just a plot device as it is in often other games. Like, you know, mm -hmm. lots of games use it as just a plot device to, you know, even like in one of the more recent Mortal Kombat, it, you, you can't do anything with the time travel, just they do time travel. Mm -hmm. But in this game, you, there are specific side quests that require the time travel. And like the first time I discovered those things, like one of Robo's most major quests, like that was fascinating to me. And like how they discuss the passage of time. You know, I, when I figured out who the prophet is, when we finally get to the floating city and it clicks, oh wait, I think I know who that is. Wait, I think I understand the connection here because it's <laughs> levels upon levels. Mm -hmm. That that kind of plot writing I just didn't see anywhere else for a long time, and there have been plenty of incredible RPGs since Chrono Trigger. But I just feel like there's something so smart about the way you discover information in this game. Like you said, Katie, like it is like being a detective. And also, like while we're still in and out of spoiler territory, I never played a game at this point where the hero died ever. And so the fact that you not only lose Chrono, but then can decide not to get him back or get him back yeah and, mm -hmm. and how you do it affects how he comes back who hugs him who, like depending on who's in your party when you bring him back all of that stuff uh chrono sacrifice is the first time ever when i played a video game that i cried playing a video game because mm -hmm. i didn't think it was real because of course no one told me that was going to happen my friends just like yeah. keep playing you're gonna like it 
and like that moment happens and I'm like, wait, no. That just no, doesn't no, no. happen in the game, and certainly not no. that far into a game. If no. they're mm -hmm. if they're gonna do that to the the character you're controlling, it's because it's the intro sequence, and they want to pull a punch on you. Yeah, but which is another reason why you just Lavos works so well as this, because like even when they think they're finally ready, nope, kills the main character of the game like nothing, yeah. like nothing. <laughs> exactly. You were talking about how kind kind of like how no game had used time travel to that like. To, to that effect so far uh, when I remember watching my friend play it for the first time only a couple months ago and when she got to the uh, to the side quest portion the second half of the game the spice jerky part yeah. she's like <laughs> I, you probably know what I mean she's like wait a minute this is a time travel game if I do this and she's like oh my god yeah <laughs> I can't believe that worked there's there's like, the yeah, treasure chest that's that you trigger baby <laughs> yeah there's those treasure chests that you can't open until you have the pendant and they're there throughout time. And that point where you go, well, if I open it too early, it's gonna be open the whole time. But if I open it mm -hmm. later and then go back, will there be more items? And there are. It was the first game I think of, again, not the first ever, but the first I can think of, that all of those little moments, those little things of, well, is the reaction different if I bring a different character? Is if I take on the Black Omen in 2300, is anything going to happen? No, you've already lost. But what if I do it before that and then go back and go back? Can I do this, the pseudo final dungeon three times and get everything three? Yeah, yeah, you can. Mm -hmm. Those those sort of things where we take for granted now how often those little choices can play out in fun little ways. We weren't used to getting that. And Chrono Trigger, again, little clockwork gears, you get those and they don't make a big deal out of it there's some little goofy ones that happen there's you know the little very specific that if you're playing at normal casual speed two minute period where if you beat lavos during that point you get a completely ridiculous ending yeah Th those yep. sorts of things that would normally be schoolyard rumors but they're in the game talk to the developers so if you beat the game early enough so few of the so few of the endings are like phoned in too. Right. Like, yeah. Like they th they thought about like all of the different scenarios that would play out depending on when you beat Lavos, and some of them are like really impactful. Like if you don't save Chrono, like you get a much more you get a much sadder but kind of hopeful ending. You know. Mm -hmm. it, what I love about the game is that is that all these subtle kind of it's different if you play it if you play it a different way. Like it doesn't even just tie in with the time travel. It's like they could have gotten away with that but oh, yeah. no like th the game has all these little tiny changes even if you just play it with like different party members mm -hmm. like there's this one part where they have to sleep over at glenn's house right before they're going to take on magus mm -hmm. and if you happen to have L luca and robo in your party it only happens with these two luca will sleep up against robo's shoulder it's like tiny little deep because they're super close it's like yeah. tiny little details like that the game is full of them like if you go during the side quest portion, if you go to um, when you do frog side quests to um, repower the Masamune to its full potential, if you have Magus in your party, when the Masamune shines, Magus will like blind himself and like not like <laughs> little tight like because it, it it literally hurts him. Yeah, it's like just tiny little details like that. And the game is like the game is so built around like try it multiple times like the way every party member is viable and it is built around different party combinations because of the tech system like you want to actually try that's one of my favorite things about it is i just like i'll get to a boss i've tried a million times and i'll be like you know what it's been a while since i've done a chrono marley ayla like 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 uh set up for this boss let's try that out and then you kind of discover you're like oh certain party members are better for combinations are better for certain bosses like yeah every rpg has that to an extent but it's done so well it's done so well in chrono trigger because of like things like the tech system where party members bounce off of each other and the fact that it was genius enough to actually make it so that every party member levels up even if you're not using them oh my god i love that about it so, so good much like <laughs> They're leveling up in the background. It's just 
it's such a brilliant game. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the tech system, it, like at that time also, I'd never seen a game where you got to combine moves. Like just watching three, you know, the 3D strike with Robo uh, Frog and and, and uh, Chrono. All of these ways that you could, you know, the, the special items that you would get that would allow for triple techs later on, like Dark Matter and whatever else. Like, I just, I love that this game had so many different ways you could interact and learn the systems to see mm -hmm. these characters do different things. And even the new stuff they added for the DS slash PlayStation version all felt natural to it, like Ozzy's Castle and mm -hmm. like all of these side quests where you could do extra stuff within the game. None of it felt tacked on. All of it felt very much a part of the world that already existed. Yeah, no. Like, I don't know. I don't know what things were added for the DS game because that was the first one I played completely. So I think that is a testament to that design. Going off what you said, I think one of the one of the moments I kind of realized like how how much the way you play the game can like be so satisfying is people. I always see people get stuck on the Golem Sisters, mm -hmm. and I'm always like, I'm always like, try Robo and Ayla. And then they do that, and then they realize that they literally have a tech that freezes them in time, and then you can wipe them out with two moves. And it makes it so much easier just because you thought of like a different party combination. Right. I, just, I love that about the game so much. It is. And I think for people who are listening to this who don't know a ton about Chrono Trigger, I do want to talk a moment a little in detail of what the battle system is and does and why it's so great. It is a little bit of that evolution of a Final Fantasy style active time battle. When your time bar fills, it's your turn. But continuing that idea of wheels within wheels and systems within systems and how these things interplay, everybody has an attack and there's special moves called techs. Everybody only has like, I wanna say around six or eight of them before you bring magic into the whole equation. And everybody does, most people do learn magic, but they only learn one element. You know, Chrono is lightning and Marl is ice, Luca is fire, and so on. If you were born before magic happened because Lavos brought magic, you didn't have magic. If you were a robot, so you didn't have magic. <laughs> there was justifications for everything, but you had elemental-ish things. But if you waited for other party members' time bars to fill up, you could combine different techs. If you knew, depending on which things you know, you know, Chrono, one of his early moves is Cyclone, just spinning around with his sword and just tearing through people. Luca, when she learns fire, can set Chrono's sword on fire as he's spinning around, and it's, uh, I think it's called Fire Whirl. It mm -hmm. probably has a bunch of different names depending on translations. And eventually, yes, you can learn to, through some items and some quests, if you let everybody's time bar fill up, you can do triple techs as well. And they allow for hitting different elemental weaknesses, but stronger. They allow for different coverage of the battlefields because also the battles themselves. This was one of the early games where random battles didn't feel that random. They were triggered by your actions on the map. You'd see enemies doing stuff, you know, foes about. If you caught their attention, you started a fight. Sometimes they would sneak up on you, but you saw where they snuck up on you. Mm -hmm. There wasn't any sort of whooshy transition to a battle screen. I mean, the PS1 version of Chrono Trigger would still slow down when setting up a battle, but that's the problem with the PS1 version of this game. But what you saw was what you fought. It was immediate, it was convenient. You didn't just line up where you were on either side. So how Chrono and Frog did their X slash, where they would both shoot forward with their swords and cross upon uh, a single foe, anyone who was in the way got hit. Cyclone might hit everybody, or it might not, depending on the battlefield. And that is something where, again, a lot of little details paying off. And yeah. you start the battle right there. Right you there. You don't go to a separate screen. That's one of the coolest things about it. It makes the world feel so seamless, you know? Yeah. So immersive, because, yeah, unlike, unlike the Final Fantasy games, it doesn't, like, do, like, an animation where then you pop into a completely separate battle screen. No, you do the battle right there. Map the is battle. Yeah. yeah, it's one of those things that I think... I mean, there, there's so much to talk about this game, and it's going to be impossible for us to cover all of it, but I think what makes this game the strongest package that it is is everything we've talked about thus far 
and also the music. I think if we don't spend some time <laughs> talking about uh, Yusunori Mitsuda and Nobo Umatsu, of course, and I'm sorry if I butchered those names, I've, I'm trying my best. Um, I, uh, I, I've never been good at, at pronouncing Japanese names, but that's on me. But like, they're not only two of the most famous composers within RPG history, but at this time were had composed some of the best games in the Final Fantasy series, though there had only been five or six at this point. Um, I don't. I never remember whether six came out first or Chrono Trigger came out first. I think six came out first. I, think I believe so too. six. Yeah, yeah, I believe so. And this was actually Yatsunori Matsuda's first composition. Uh, right. Yeah. Credit. He go, yeah. He goes on to be integral to a ton of RPGs. Yeah. And like. It was the first game I played where there was a theme for everything. There were moments, you know, even short moments had songs, long moments had songs. And like, and I've talked about this on other podcasts about soundtracks being integral to movies. I feel like this game wouldn't be half of what it is without the music. And like, I remember scenes because of the composition of the scene and the music, like the trial mm. scene when Chrono's on trial, you know, the first Magus fight, as I say, as said before, you know, Frog's theme. Each character had their own theme. Certain all, all the maps had their own themes. The time periods had their own themes. You know, even characters within the world of time had their own themes. It's just it was wild how specific this was. And I know other Final Fantasy games had done that, but I feel like this was on a scope much larger than anything else that had come before it. It was the largest soundtrack of the time when it came out on CD. I think it was three discs, and it was, if not the largest, one of the largest soundtracks of, uh, up to that point. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's incredible what they could do, because this is all, you know, 16-bit. All of it is MIDI, none of it, and, like, they create orchestrations. Like, I think of the titular song, Chrono Trigger, the song that plays every time you travel through time and every time something heroic happens. That song sounds like it could be scored and has been scored in the past in certain symphony concerts that they've done, but, like, it sounds like that on a Super Nintendo. And, of course, the sounds got remastered on the DS and the later compositions, mm -hmm. but it's still the basics. It's still that original composition. The complexity of it is still astonishing to me that you can be so expressive with music at a time when the, the resources were pretty limited. Yeah. I believe Mitsuda, like, it was, like, make or break for him. Like he was like he was like that like give like I want to move up in the in the company I want to yes. do more like give me this project and Uematsu was like okay prove yourself with this game or else like you're not gonna get much you know I, much I think else. Mitsuda and, went to Sakaguchi and went like yeah give me a, let me compose something or I walk yeah I think I think it was like yeah yeah and and he literally put himself in the hospital yep. from from working on this soundtrack and. He, like, it's literally blood, sweat, and tears, and it shows. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. And it's 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 a credit to the both of them that, like, you can know, okay, oh, Uematsu did it, too. Which tracks did he do? He did, he tried to work with Mitsuda's style, and yeah. it yeah. made a cohesive whole. Yeah. yeah. And, like, but the songs that are, are, um, are, um, Umatsu's are like the boss battle theme, which very much sounds like the kinds of other, the first boss battle Yeah, theme. oh yeah. Mm -hmm. it sounds like his other compositions. Like you can pull his song, like he did the underground sewer theme. Like all of those songs have his stamp Maybe on it. He did Tyranno Lair. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Whereas the Kingdom of Zeal is just otherworldly and strange. Oh, the best theme in the game. Oh my God. <laughs> when I first showed up there, I didn't know what Ford. was what. The maps yeah. were strange. I'm floating in the sky. What are these bell sounds? <laughs> the the feeling was complete. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, 100. Um, percent Before we start to wrap up, I think something fun would be to talk about our favorite characters because I think the characters make this game right. The writing, of course, drives that, and this has some of the best character develop I, development I've seen in RPGs. None of the characters, for the most part, are tropes. Most of them, you know, especially at this time and even after this time, a lot of women were written very tropey. But, like, the, the two female leads in this game very much are outside of what was the norm in even RPGs or games in general. You know, there's a princess who, yes, you have to rescue, but after you rescue her is a valuable, if not one of the most valuable party members who can take care of herself and save your ass several times. And so uh, like, can we talk about the fact that the princess later has to save the main male protagonist? Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, it, yeah. Was it was just like, the, and and I think that these characters are just, they're so charming, they're so well written, 
and it's impossible not to love them. My, of course, as I said earlier, my favorite character is Magus, and he was ca- he was my favorite character at first because oh, he's just a cool character. He's got a scythe, long blue hair. He looks like Piccolo. What's not to love? But his story, his arc, especially once you get to the Kingdom of Zeal, makes it. He's such an easy character to understand, even if you continue to view him as the villain. You get so much context for everything that he's done. And so he'll always be one of my favorites, and my runner-up will always be Robo, because I'm a sucker for a charming robot every time. That's but, fair. Uh, Jeff, what, who was your favorite character in the game if you had to pick one? If I had to pick one, first of all, I do want to say Magus is such a thing of cool motive, still murder. But... <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely, 100%. <laughs> and and, and I, I am not immune to the charms of, of uh, Piccolo Sephiroth at all. Yeah, exactly. I'm not immune <laughs> to his charms. But if I had to pick a favorite, actually Luca. Mm, yeah. I, oh, okay. Yeah, no, I like mechanic characters. Luca is absolutely the character where if this were a different game, she would have the foulest mouth, and I appreciate yes. that about her. <laughs> she is the character that's just like, wait, you built a time machine? What, like it's hard? <laughs> oh, look, a robot from a future. I'm a be friends with this. We are best friends now. And they are. And Robo is a secondary for me as well. And I love their relationship and their friendship. And Luca is Luca is a fully realized character and has insecurities that she puts a brave front on. She has strengths that she knows to play to. She has, there's so much to her. And I really appreciate that. What about you, Katie? Uh, I thought everyone was going to say this one. My favorite's Frog. Frog's Um, incredible. (laughs) He's a great character. Yeah. Uh, No, I'm glad that we had the variety like that. I was like, oh, crap. I'm going to say what everyone else is saying. But I guess that's a testament to Chrono Trigger, right? Yeah. There's so many good ones. There's no passengers on that train. I love everyone in that party. Yeah. Let's be real. Yeah, that's the thing. It's one of the only JRPGs I've played where I don't dislike any single party member. Yeah. Like, they're all good. Um, gameplay wise too. Um, I just I I I think for it's Frog for me because his entire his entire story is just based around the idea of we are not defined by our past mm-hmm. and we can move on from our mistakes. His entire thing is about kind of redemption and regaining his the strength, the inner strength that he lost from failing his best friend basically and what and losing his best friend. Um Frog's kind of one of those characters who I think kind of becomes even more interesting the more you kind of think about him. Like one of my favorite endings in the game is um is the Oath, which is the one where uh, Frog actually sets out to fight Magus alone, and a mm-hmm. lot of people kind of wonder like who won the fight because they make it ambiguous. And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, well, if Frog won the fight, it's entirely possible that like on his own like just driven solely by revenge oh yeah frog isn't that far away from becoming his own magus his yeah. own evil like um, that's what makes him so interesting and more, more, like one of the deepest characters to me is like he could have he could have gone down that route he could have gone down a much darker road if you really think about it there's a lot of subtle little things about him like that. yeah because magus is also defined by his failure and his mistakes exactly exactly and yeah. and uh He's also, if you uh, beat the DS or PS1 uh, slash DS version of the game, he's Vegeta. So exactly. <laughs> there's that yeah, too. Green hair Vegeta. <laughs> yeah, green hair Vegeta. <laughs> Joining red haired Goku and white haired Piccolo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I like that we have such diversity of favorite characters. It is like you said, Katie, a testament to how great all these characters are. I also want to shout out really quick before we wrap up one of my favorite side missions because it was the first time I saw horror in a 16-bit game. But when you pursue Frog's past to, you know, get his like ultimate version, you encounter Cyrus's ghost. And that was terrifying to me as a kid. The way he only speaks in one words, his movement, this bloated Mm -hmm. suit of armor that looks like his armor. It was just so... It's minimalism is what made it so scary to me. Mm -hmm. And and it's just really cool when a game can do that. And there are many moments like that in Chrono Trigger where they genre defy and and defy the, the, I think, just the medium of video games in general with the little touches that they do. Yeah. 
I also realize I never answered your question about a defining moment of the game for me. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. We'd get back to it eventually. No, that's fine. And I was, because uh, I was racking my brain this whole time, and something you said before triggered it for me. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, the trial. The trial is probably one yeah, of my- Yeah, that's a good one. It, it is a defining moment for me because the game begins at the Millennial Fair. You get the most delightful RPG tutorial that's also just- You could just spend so much time there. You could fight mm -hmm. Gato. You can go to the Tent of Horrors. You And you do so many things and you just play it like you're playing a video game. You play it like you're playing an RPG. And then- you travel through time, you have a wacky adventure, you come back, you're put on trial for kidnapping the princess, and all of your actions are put <laughs> under a microscope. <laughs> and so all of us had those moments of, oh, I'm a monster. <laughs> not like I'm not setting fire to townsfolk or anything, but I'm ruining people's days. I'm being kind of, I'm being, I'm a bit of a bully, aren't I? <laughs> and to then like, I'm gonna start the game again. I'm gonna I, like, you know, tor first tutorial fight in Undertale. Like I'm gonna make this good, reset and do it. And you still lose. Yeah. It's still, even when you win, it's still stacked against you and you still have to move forward. And there's a couple of points in the game where you can lose boss battles and the game doesn't go to game over. Game over is technically an ending, but the thing still continues. And that's such a beautiful microcosm. And just that whiplash moment of, oh man, I stole that guy's lunch. Oh, I was impatient. Oh, I did, I, hmm. <laughs> it really I makes you quit. I, I'm, I'm, it, it, it was the first game that made me question my actions as a video game character. So, yeah, I think that was a defining moment to me. I think real quick, mine would probably just be the, um, and I still don't entirely know why, but it's the uh, Tyranno Bridge, Tyranno Lair Bridge scene where oh, uh, so you fight um, the uh, Black Tyranno and then yeah. the subsequent uh, scene of Lavos and kind of the discovery of what Lavos was at uh in in 65 million bc is kind of um mind blowing to me mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah because at that point and, you thought you knew what lavos was for a while and then mm -hmm. that was all thrown wildly askew and this answered yeah. it and it wasn't what any of us were expecting it's a beautifully tragic scene too with azala and, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know just something about the mixture of the visuals of that scene the music and like azala's sacrifice and that plot twist, it all comes together for the scene I love the most. And I, I can't exactly explain why, because and there's so many that are just so close anyway, but if I had to pick one, that would be it. It's very bittersweet in a way. There's, you know, remember yeah. us, we didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oops. And then Ayla's like, she, she's a good person, she still tries to save her, like. Yeah. 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 It, 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 it's one of those games that I think is absolutely divine, defined by the sum of its parts, and Yes. I just don't know that there will ever be a game like it just because like we joke we joked about Chrono Cross and we'll talk about Chrono Cross at, at, at another time, but like Chrono Cross was never gonna live up to this game because there are no games like it. And unless you made the same thing again with better graphics, which I wouldn't say no to either, it, it's gonna be hard to capture this lightning in a bottle. I think it's got too many different things in the same way that people were, I think, disappointed by Mass Effect Andromeda after the Mass Effect trilogy. It's just when you have something of a certain level of expectation, it's very hard to meet that because not everyone loves this game for the same reason, mm -hmm. but it's all of yeah. those reasons that make it good, make it great. Very cool. well said. Yeah. yeah. This mm -hmm. this was, I, they called it the dream team that came together and yeah. made this game. This had this had pedigree, pedigree going into it and created pedigree going forth. You had the creators of Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest working on this. You had big people behind those producing it, working on it. People who composed, designed, created for it, went on to direct future Final Fantasy titles, Xenogears, uh, Chrono Cross, Baton Kaitos, and I'm sure so many others that I'm not even thinking of. How cool that Chrono Trigger itself kind of it was a foreshadowing of Square Enix, if yes. you really think about it. In its way, yeah. 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 Proof of concept. <laughs> yeah. What happened? Exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, well, this, this has been an incredibly delightful discussion. Um, thank you both for joining me. Um, before we wrap up, starting with Kate and then Jeff and myself, 
Kate. Katie, why don't you tell folks where they can find you and what you do on the internet and how they can check out all of your incredible work? Uh, sure. Um, I uh, I post uh, various uh, topics on video games. I talk about video games on my Twitter, which is where I am at m- mainly. And I, I'm big into fashion and I post a lot of outfits. Uh, sometimes, like I said, inspired by video games. Uh, and you can find that at ChronoKatie, one word, on uh, YouTube. Twitter and Twitch and Instagram. It's like, yeah, are those the four places I'm at? Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yes, your outfits are to die for. They are absolutely phenomenal oh, thank you. every time. You constantly look stunning on Twitter and oh. it, it is it is always awesome. So keep doing thank that because I hella love to see it. Um, oh. I just Jeff, realized I wasn't we... following you until right now. So oh. <laughs> well, amended. Now. Amended. Um, Jeff, we're going to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No worries. <laughs> Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at uh, Jeff, G-E-O-F-F, Makes Noise. Jeff Makes Noise. And I also uh, stream on Twitch under Not Jeff at All, and that's Jeff, J-E-F-F. If that's confusing for you, tough. <laughs> this is my life. <laughs> and, of course, you can find me right here on Certain POV, as well as I am DJ underscore Stormageddon in almost every place. But if you want one convenient place to find everything that I do, of course, you can go to djstormageddon.com. Thank you again both for being here. Um, I couldn't have thought of a better dream team to discuss this game. So Aww. I'm really glad <laughs> thank you. This is so great. Yeah, thank you. It is so fun to discuss a game that means so much to so many people. And I'm always delighted when I find someone who is as passionate about a thing as I am. And so you, you were the decision from the start, Chrono Katie. Once we decided that we needed to do this episode, you were our oh guest. Oh my God. And so <laughs> I'm glad you were able to make this work. The, um, thank you everyone for listening. Um, if you enjoy what you hear here, please go to your podcast platform of choice and rate, review, and subscribe to Fun and Games Podcast. We also have a main show where Jeff and I talk about different topics within the gaming industry, have different guests within the gaming industry, and just have fun talking about video games. Imagine that, having fun talking about video games. <laughs> That's what the show is all about. It is, but it has been a pleasure to be here to celebrate the 100th episode of this incredible series with one of my all-time favorite games with two incredible guests. And remember, as always, happy gaming. <laughs>